When learning neonatal resuscitation, there are the essentials and advanced, but here we're going beyond advanced. When you look over the initial steps section of the NRP algorithm, there is this curious branch to the algorithm for labored breathing. In that branch is this action step to consider CPAP. It reminds me of the words from that great playwright. To CPAP or not CPAP, that is the question. Whether it is nobler to help the distressed baby breathe with CPAP or to allow more time to grunt and sweat under a weary life. But perchance the distress has another cause. Could it be this child has a pneumothorax and CPAP may only worsen, nay even cause such injury? Ay, there's the rub. The pneumothorax does make cowards of us all and we lose the name of action. Well, at least that's how I remember it. Consider CPAP. We can't be talking about premature babies with respiratory distress syndrome. I mean, CPAP is the foundation of our current treatment for RDS. CPAP is critical for those babies to establish functional residual capacity and open their lungs to allow effective ventilation. We don't consider CPAP for RDS. We give it. When I'm in the delivery room for a premature baby, I tell my RT, only half jokingly, to reach across the room and apply the CPAP to the baby as they are coming to the warmer. My point is, I don't want to wait even a moment before I apply CPAP to the very premature baby. No, the conundrum comes from the late preterm to term babies. For those babies, RDS becomes less and less likely with increased gestational age to be the cause of respiratory distress. Transient tachypnea of the newborn, TTN, becomes more likely. So what do we know about CPAP for TTN in the delivery room? There are two randomized trials. Both looked at late preterm to term babies born by C-sections, which we know is a risk factor for TTN. Both used the same intervention, CPAP at 5 centimeters of water for 20 minutes. The first used a more prophylactic approach where CPAP was started before 10 minutes of life. The other study was an early rescue strategy for babies with established respiratory distress within 6 hours of birth. The comparison was standard care with blow by oxygen as needed. The outcome for both was admission rate to the NICU. The results for both were a reduction in NICU admissions, 3% compared to 8.8% in the first and 5.9% compared to 30% in the second. The overall higher rates in the second being explained by the established respiratory distress at the time of enrollment into the study. I find this set of data pretty compelling and see CPAP as an effective means to transition babies and keep them from a NICU admission. Of course, my worry is pneumothorax, both causing it by applying positive pressure or the pneumothorax being the cause of the distress in the first place. We are talking about being in the delivery room, and I don't know about where you work, but I don't have an x-ray to help me decide. Here, I find this paper by Smith Hart et al. to be helpful. It is one of several papers that you can find demonstrating an increased risk of pneumothorax with face mask CPAP used in the delivery room. In this study, from 3.7% not getting delivery room CPAP to 16.9% for those who did get CPAP in the delivery room. But what they showed that was further helpful was that the babies on 21% oxygen with CPAP had even higher odds of pneumothorax as compared to those getting both oxygen and CPAP. So not requiring oxygen is riskier for giving CPAP. They also demonstrated that the pneumothorax rates increased with increasing gestational age with the full-term and post-term babies at the highest risk. So how can we put this data together? How can we harness the benefits of CPAP in the delivery room to avoid a NICU admission and have these babies stay with their parents, but avoid the negative outcome of a pneumothorax? I don't think anyone knows for certain, but I will share how I have put this together in my own practice. Mind you, this is not studied. I haven't done a trial of this algorithm, so in that sense, it is not evidence-based, but it is based on the evidence the published evidence we have so far. If I have a baby in the delivery room that is either tachypnic or grunting or having retractions or is requiring oxygen for desaturation shortly after birth, the first decision point is whether this was a C-section birth without labor versus a vaginal birth or a C-section after having been in labor. If it was an elective C-section, then yes, I will apply CPAP 5 by face mask to the baby for 20 minutes. I think the two randomized trials I cited support this practice. However, if it was a vaginal birth or C-section after a period of labor, I am more cautious. I'll first try a little patience to see if the baby transitions with more time and give blow by oxygen if needed guided by pulse oximetry. If the baby still doesn't transition and they are 38 weeks or greater, then I will not do CPAP in the delivery room. Better in my mind to admit to the NICU, get a chest x-ray and decide what you are really treating. Here I am using the information that the higher the gestational age of the baby, the more risk to cause a pneumothorax with CPAP. Now, if the baby is 35 to 37 weeks GA, then I decide on a case-by-case -case basis whether to try the 20 minutes of CPAP in the delivery room. If they require oxygen, I'm a little more likely to try the CPAP than if they are not requiring oxygen. But I use my best judgment based on the individual circumstances.
The three important points to remember about CPAP in the delivery room are one, CPAP is the foundation of respiratory care for preterm babies with RDS, so don't delay applying it as soon as you can while you assist the baby during the initial steps. Two, CPAP for babies at high risk for or already early TTN can benefit from 20 minutes of CPAP to resolve their respiratory distress and thus avoid an admission to the NICU. Three, the risk we take with CPAP use in the delivery room is pneumothorax, but we do know the ones most at risk for this negative outcome are the full-term babies and the babies not requiring any oxygen. However you decide your clinical care based on this evidence is up to you, but I encourage you to think it through and maybe come up with your own guidance like the one I shared in this video. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Like and share below and follow me here on YouTube or on Twitter. Leave a comment below if you have another idea for a topic I can cover that goes beyond advanced in neonatal resuscitation.